Thank you very much. I was supposed to give this talk on February 18th, but I think they closed the university the next day, so that didn't help. So I wanted like low light so you could see all the rocks because I couldn't bring them all, but we'll work with what we have here. Um, my name isn't up there. It's Elizabeth Gerlowski Kordesh, and I'm a professor in the Department of Geological Sciences, and so that means I'm a geologist. And I want to teach you a little bit of geology today. Um, and uh, we're going to start off thinking about Jurassic Park, because that's what most people know about when they think about the past. And there you go. Um, it was posted on the website. Do you know when the Jurassic period started? How many millions of years ago? Yes. About 200 million. Very good. She gets a t-shirt. There you go. The Jurassic period started about 201 million years ago and ended about 145 million years ago. All right. So the next question is, you saw the T-Rex. Did T-Rex actually live during the Jurassic? Yes. Cretaceous. He actually lived later on, and he lived in the Cretaceous, and we think the asteroids killed him off, right? So T-Rex is not from the Jurassic, even though it was in the movie, T-Rex is not from the Jurassic. The dinosaurs were not so elegant and large and huge and mean. Well, there were some mean ones, but, um, but uh, he did not live in the Jurassic. He's from the Cretaceous. But you know how movie people like to stretch the truth a little bit. So. Anyway, let me show you an animal that lived in the Jurassic. All right. I don't know if you can see him. I can't even say the, his name. Dilophosaurus. <laughs> um, and so this was the T-Rex of the Jurassic time. Much smaller, but has those nice teeth. And you can't see very well, but he's with trees and fresh water and all this stuff. And um, I don't know where they get the information to reconstruct the landscape in which this dinosaur is, but it's wrong, OK? It's really wrong. And so we're going to look at the Jurassic rocks that are found in Connecticut. And you can go to Dinosaur State Park. It's south of Hartford, Connecticut, where a huge dinosaur trackway, which we cannot see here, too bad, um, is exposed for people to look at, and it has these huge footprints from this dinosaur. That's a little bit better. And the name of the footprint is called Eubrontus, and actually they really don't know the exact animal that made these footprints because none of the bones have ever been found. And this, this, this is an important bit of data we'll get back to, is that there are no real bones ever preserved in these rocks in Connecticut. These are the sedimentary rocks that are from um, the Jurassic, okay? Early Jurassic. And so here's one of my pictures just trying to show. They have this diorama, and they show these beautiful streams and rivers with trees, and it looks like it's wonderful paradise. But um, I want to show you that you can understand that this is not really true. And we'll look at the rocks to tell, to tell the story. Um, here's a picture of one of, the, you brought one of the big ones. That's a lens cap from a camera for scale. So these are, can be pretty big. I have a small one here. It looks like a baby print that I found in, the, um, in an outcrop. And uh, my graduate student, Alex, will show it around, OK? You can see it. it's the bottom of it. Footprint came down. It's the bottom. So look, is this one's a little bit better. No, can't even see it. So he has trees in the background. I don't know if you can, you can see at least the trees and this fresh water. And I want to show you that you can figure out from the sediments that this is wrong, completely wrong, OK? And this landscape that they, they imagined is all in their imagination and not fact. So what do these rocks look like? 
Okay, they're layered. What, are, what kind of rocks are these again? There's, remember from geology, there's three kinds of rocks. Does anyone remember the three kinds of rocks? And metamorphic. All right, he remembers. <laughs> Igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary. Very good. I don't know if you want a t-shirt. <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Give us something for the grandchildren or something. So these, this is a sediment, these are sedimentary rocks. So they are from ancient sediments and hardened into rocks after millions of years being baked down in the center of the earth. Not the center, but deep in the earth. And so we have layering representing the sediments being laid down through time. And here you see that I have um, some black rocks here, back bands, and there's gray, and then there's, it's, these are red, you can't really see. These are red rocks. And this particular formation where their footprints are found is called the East Berlin Formation, near East Main um, representation of these outcrops, what we call rocks, um, are near East Berlin, Connecticut. And East Berlin, Connecticut is east of Berlin, Connecticut. But there's no West Berlin, Connecticut. That's a swamp. And I lived in West Berlin for many years. I was disappointed. All right. <laughs> so, so we're looking at sedimentary rocks. And the study of how they got laid down, what was the environment, is called sedimentology. Makes sense? And you can see all the structures that are present in these rocks, and this is what we look at, these sedimentary structures. So I'm going to read this. You may not be able to see it. So this field encompasses the study of modern sediments and the processes that result in their deposition. And we use that application to study sedimentary rocks that have the same structures for the reconstruction of past environments. All right? And so we look at sediment types. Is it mud? Is it sand? Is it gravel? We look at grain size. That tells you mud is very fine. Sand and gravel, different sizes because they travel differently because they're heavier or lighter. And um, how they're deposited in lobes or in sheets and things like that. And we look at their sedimentary structures to get a better idea of what's going on exactly in that environment. Okay. So what you're going to do today is you're going to learn about some sedimentary structures. And I'm going to teach you how things get deposited a little bit so you get a little idea of how this works. And then we'll go back to the um, dinosaur problem, the dinosaur landscape problem. Okay? Okay, it's still working? All right. So and we'll have a quiz later. <laughs> All right? So these are the sedimentary structures I want to teach you today. All right? So you can become geologists. So next time you see some layered rocks, I want you to stop the car, get out, look closely, and you'll be able to see some of this stuff. And you can see a lot of this in national parks. I teach a course, Geology of National Parks, and I teach the kids this. They can see them in the rocks in many of the national parks. So next time you go, you take a little closer look. So I'm going to go over mud cracks, which is good because you say it's your cracking mud. That means it's drying out. That's telling you something about the environment. I'm going to talk about graded bedding, then cross bedding, and then ripple marks or ripple cross lamination. And I have lots of samples here. We'll try to show them around as we go along. I'll try to explain what all this means, OK? Mud cracks. You guys go and bring the, take the mud cracks around. Mud cracks have a specific polygonal pattern as you look down at the surface of the, of, of the ground that it's found on, of the sediment, OK? They're always polygonal. That must, that's a physics thing. They can figure that out. So they all look like that. And he's, they're showing around. Chris, my other graduate student, is helping Alex here. And Alex is showing one where it's, you can see the side where it's filled in, because these are cracks, and they fill in with sediment. They may be the same sediment, and then you can't see it as well, or something completely different, and they stick out really well. OK, let me show you some examples here. Some from the modern, we can go to Death Valley. 
Those are real nice cracks. They're about a meter across here. Um, oh, this is Bonneville, sorry. <laughs> Next one is Death Valley. So it is the Bonneville Salt Flats. This is where they race the cars because it's really, really flat. And the salt isn't that overwhelming. And this is really where you have a lot of mud cracks involved. And here's Death Valley. Same thing, modern. So we can find these in the rocks. And there's examples here going around. So this is telling you that it's dried out. It gets wet, it gets deposited, and then it dries out. So that's one hint of a really awful environment, as in Death Valley, OK? Now the next structures I'm going to tell you about, I need to teach you a little bit about sediment movement, or it won't make any sense. So we're imagining water moving the sediment in a river across these Death Valley plains, all right? And there's three different what we call sediment loads involved. You have the bed load, which we'll talk about a lot when we talk about these structures. And that's the stuff that stays on the surface and is moved along by the water. So the finer the sediment and the faster the current, you know, the faster it goes. And as it gets bigger with grain size, then you need even more higher currents to move it. Okay, So you can tell generally how fast some of these currents are about what the bed load is. The second type of load is called suspended load. And that's the stuff, if it's very fine, and the turbulence will keep those grains sitting in the water column itself and moving along. And eventually, they will fall down once the current ends. All right? And then, of course, you have dissolved load, something that dissolves in the water and moves somewhere and can precipitate out. Okay? So what we're going to deal with today is just the bed load and show you that we can have some really pretty sedimentary structures that are associated with the movement of sediment by water, by currents, unidirectional currents. All right? Everyone got that? All right. So let's go to graded bedding. What is that? Well, here is an example where you have coarse sand, and it finds upward to fine sand. What does that mean? That means that the current was very strong, and then it slowed down slowly. So first, the heaviest stuff, the larger grains, were deposited first. And then as you go along, finer and finer grains until it stops. Okay. So you have graded bedding. And this is the bed load. So what from this, I get the idea that the big current stops. And I'll tell you more when we get to the muddier ones. But this is, tells you that the current doesn't happen all the time. That means it's not like the Hocking River. It flows all the time and it's fresh. This is telling you something else, that the water stops. OK, so this is a different kind of environment. right? Now what the really pretty stuff that we find with the bed load is that the water, as it moves the sediment, it, can, it does stuff to it. Okay, You can make ripples out of these. And now they will take around some more ripple stuff. Give me that one. Uh, Alex, give me that one, because that one, the one, the one with the really obvious one. Yeah. So you can have surfaces. I mean, you've seen these on the beach, right? And you know that happens with the tides and whatever. These happen um, with, with tides. They happen with unidirectional currents. And so you're sifting, with the, sifting the bed load here, the sediment, depending on how strong your current is. All right? And so there's all different variables involved here. We'll get to that. So these are the pretty stuff that you find. Now, the asymmetric ripple marks are telling us it's a unidirectional current. It's only one way. If it was symmetrical, then it has to be two ways. That means it could be related to tides. So I get a lot of information on the type of ripples I have. So that's pretty cool. Okay. All right. So here, so in a rock, 
when it's inside and you see the whole structure, the 3D thing, we call it ripple cross lamination, the bed form here, asymmetric ripple forms. And how they work is pretty interesting. You have the flow direction, the sediment moves across and falls down these four sets as it moves along. And you get these little laminae here that indicate the direction of the current. So I can even know which way ancient rivers are flowing, which is really neat, okay? And here I have a diagram that just kind of shows it that they, it comes up, these ripple forms, falls down, avalanches down, comes up, avalanches down, and it moves slowly along on the stream bed, all right? The trough. Why is it rippled? It's the speed. I'm going to get to that, okay? There's different forms that form depending on a couple variables. We'll get to that in a second. So this is a ripple bed form. And just to show you, that's a small scale. When you get to the large scale, a lot more water, a lot more sediment, then you have larger curved laminae. And these form what we call trough cross bedding. So this is more energy, more sediment. And at Zion National Park, whoever's been there has seen this. Pretty impressive, right? Yes. We'll get to that. OK. He said that at Zion, there's a lot of ripples and trough cross beds that are formed by wind as well. I was going to get to that. Water is one example that I'm giving you here, but it can also be, and it's the next slide. See, these geology majors really know what I'm talking about. OK. So you can have this forming. And here's another diagram that might help. And so the water current has a sediment. And the size, of course, depends on uh, the depth of the water and things. I'll have the list here coming up. And so when you have wind, the same thing happens, especially with these big trough cross beds. So here you have wind in different directions. Um, and so when the water current, river, or even in the ocean moves, and it depends on the depth of the sand and what's moving in the energy to make these particular sedimentary structures. Okay, So you get erosion, and you get some really pretty looking stuff. This is also from Zion, my personal picture here. And so these are trough cross bedded beds, but everything around it is gone. They have, they're like a little column of it, so it's really cool looking. Okay? And just as a funny picture, here I am as a graduate student, many years ago, posing on some really big trough cross beds in North Carolina, <laughs> in a rift basin, huh, you guys? All right. All right. So let me tell you how we know all this and give you the, the chemists and the physicists a little bit more detail here. OK, they, they studied this in flumes in labs back in the 60s and 70s. They really got into this. And so they looked at variables, different variables. So they worried about steady flow to control this, open, straight, and wide flumes. and they looked at seven variables that would control water flowing and carrying these sediments or pushing them along. So here are those variables. Flow depth, flow strength, the viscosity of the fluid, which in most cases, you know, just water. Uh, so I had fluid density is just water. Sediment size, the grain size, is it a cobble or is it a piece of mud or what? So that means the sediment density is different. So that will control the hydrodynamics more. And of course, you need gravity. But you know that's uniform. We don't need to worry about that except in science fiction. OK. So these are the things that they studied. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Since that gravity is important here for some people, very important. OK. So here is just one of the diagrams that's simplified, because there's a whole bunch of these and all this data. And so this is generally plotted with mean grain size, going from very fine grain to very much larger. For two millimeters, that's a big grain of sand. And the mean flow to a velocity. So as you go from fine and slow to fine and 
or uh, gr greater and larger. And as you go upward, the type of sedimentary structures that form because of the water velocity changes. So you have a good idea of how fast the water was going to make your different sedimentary structures. All right? It's not a honed science like in physics or chemistry because we don't know how big the rivers were or, or anything like that. But this gives us an idea of the power and therefore what kind of river it is. You get some hints, OK? So here are those ripples. And it turns out that um, you get into dunes. This is the trough cross bedding. And then when you get up here, it gets crazy. Okay, And that doesn't get preserved. So you have a whole range of structures that you see as velocity increases. Okay, And then, of course, decreases. So I have this even more simplified for you. And so the this is going downward here for increase. Um, you have ripples. And it has the flow unidirectional. And here are they call mega ripples. These are the trough cross beds. And you have then more power and more power until the sediment is all over the place and you don't get structures. It's moved somewhere else. Okay? So we looked at ripple cross lamination. So there's some movement. And we have trough cross bedding, which more power, more sediment to move um, as you go down this, this diagram here. Now, people have modeled this in detail and looking at the variables. And I want to show you three little animations about how these things form through time. Because back in the 80s, they could do the computer modeling. And this is from a website, switch it, um, from the United States Geological Survey. And these are nice little videos showing you how these things form with the very different variables um, that I showed you. And is that going to work? Go ahead. This is our formation of climbing ripples. There's so much sediment that they just keep accumulating through time. And these can be preserved in the record. And you see there's these laminae. And now they're turning it. So this can be flat, or this can be turned depending on what direction you're looking at it. So you have to be careful when you're in the outcrop to know what side. You have to look at all sides in 3D to understand exactly how these things form. So here you can see on one side here, now you see it's only flat. And you see the laminate here, so you know the direction here. These are um, cut off. These are the crests. Sometimes they're lined up perfectly. And you saw that some of these were not. Here's that one that's really straight here. Yeah, so you have, sometimes they're very, very straight. And then you can show around the one that's sliced on the, Chris, the, the one that's sliced from the top. Um, I have ripple, a ripple cross lamination. No, no, that's the trough. You can show that around too. But there's the one where I sliced it so you can look on top and see how it tries to be linear. It, yes, that's it. In nature, it's never so perfect most of the time. So I'll give you an idea. So here's another one. You have a lot of little troughs here forming and adding on with time. So this is more like trough cross stratification, different scale. See how it forms through time. So there's really troughs on the top as, you, as it forms. And it's pretty cool. And I think these all are a certain sand size regular medium sand size. And then they turn it around, and you can see the different directions of the current. So you look at it, the current direction can be discerned immediately from these sedimentary structures. So you know which way the sediment moved, which helps when you're trying to reconstruct the total landscape. Okay. There's the troughs. There you see them. Okay. As you go down. So that's why it's called trough cross bedding, right? Very pretty. <laughs> and one more? Which one is this one? Um, net migration. OK, so it's whether it moves along or stays and accumulates, 
depends on the amount of sediment input. So if it's accumulating very fast, then the ripple, you know, it stays in place and you start seeing different type of patterns if it's moving a little bit more and you're displacing that crest line as you go or the trough. So you have different structures coming out. So this is another trough in different directions. So we get trained on how to look at these things. Then we go in the field and we measure the direction we know that the current went. And we worry about how that works. So for a river, that never goes in one direction. There's always eddies and things like that. So it's not as straightforward, but it gives us a better idea how that works. Okay? Very good. Thank you very much. All right. Switch it. All right. So what kind of sedimentary structure is this? You got a t-shirt. <laughs> That's right. You have a t-shirt. Look at these are really big, big trough, and they're eroded in a very unusual way, and there's lots of different colors. God, those national parks are great. <laughs> lots of nice things to see. It says a lot of trough cross bedding. Okay, in different angles, and um, some of it, you can go and walk down these things. Amazing place, okay? So you want to go, this is what it's called, it's right north of the Grand Canyon, okay? Pretty cool. All right. So, so that's the website. It's walrus, just put walrus and USGS and it'll come up in Google, okay? Pretty fun. Okay, so now you're experts in sedimentary structures and how, <laughs> and how water runs and makes sediment here in many sedimentary structures. Yes? Yes. Okay, he wants to know if you have these structures and then these are sediments, and then they're turned into sedimentary rocks. There's a lot of pressure in things. How come you can still see them, okay? Well, the thing is that there's a lot of cement that happens between the grains as the groundwater flows through it before it gets into the deep. So it starts to lithify and get very hard, and so it's harder to warp it. And so, the temperatures, what we're talking about, are not 12,000 degrees or whatever. 150 degrees, 250 degrees, it doesn't really hurt it too much, structure-wise. As long as you have the cement in there to hold it and make it tight, it's pretty tough. All right? Especially the sand. Sand is full of quartz. Quartz is pretty tough. Okay? And so you do have different types of finer sediment that suffer from compaction from that pressure. Um, and sometimes you can see that some of these grains move a little bit closer to each other. And but um, in general, you get to preserve most of it because of the early cementation. Yes? How long does it take for, these part, for, the, for the sediments to become rock? It all depends. It can take tens of millions of years to 100 million years, depending on the circumstances. Does it make a difference by the particle size, how long it takes? No. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> um, it has to be in the right circumstances, whatever it is. And cement helps a lot to lithify the rocks. And, and sometimes you can make a lot of cement if you have sand, but it's a little bit harder with mud. There's not that much space in between there to make, you know, so it takes, you know, a, it, it, that compacts more and that gets warped more than say sand does, that it has a quartz cement, you know, forget it, it's tough as rocks, ha ha, okay? <laughs> well, good questions, okay? All right, so let's go back to the East Berlin Formation. So that was, that was with the dinosaur track here. That's my dinosaur track. That's the East Berlin Formation. And you saw how red it is in some places. Would you show everything? We get everything? Pretty much? 
And so we want to see where these dinosaurs, we know they passed through, we have footprints, but we don't have the skeletons. So we want to know why that happens. Why don't we have skeletons? And that sort of tells us, the sediments will tell us, what kind of a place was it? Did the di were the dinosaurs happy here? And they live here and play here and die here? Well, maybe not. Maybe they were unhappy and didn't stay long. Let's take a look at the sediments, now that you're experts. Okay? This one is not going to work. That's the fish that's found in the black rocks. So what do I do? You can't even see that one. See, that's why I wanted February. Here is, <laughs> this is, I know as you barely see, these are these rocks. They're sedimentary rocks. They're dipping at a little angle. And so this is called an outcrop. This is where I go to do my work. You see, these rocks are exposed. I don't dig. I'm not an archaeologist. I find rocks that are exposed by highways, train tracks, something like that. Beautiful exposure. That's like the Nelsonville Bypass. You drive there, you see the rocks. Aren't they beautiful? Right? You get to see them. You go, thank you for doing that for us. All right? So I go here, and what do I do? Well, I have to measure these rocks, OK? This is my representation of that picture, which you can't see. All right? So what do I do? I have to take a tape measure. It's, uh, of course, in the meter scale. And I look at the sedimentary structures, the type of sediment. Is it mud? Is it sand? Whatever. And look and find stuff, and I measure each and every little layer I can find, OK? And here, you can see I have all these Vs. Those are the mud cracks. Look how many mud cracks. Some of them are huge. They go through the whole layer. Some of them are filled with sand, and they're easy to see. I'll show you some. Some are filled with mud, in mud, and so they're harder to see. And these black layers are what I showed you in the picture, which you could barely see. <laughs> and those are the lake deposits. These are lakes, OK? Lakes in a big rift valley, like in Africa, OK? And so they are lakes because they're very fine sediment. So this fine sediment can be carried as suspended loads. So you know these words. And it'll reach the distal part of the whole system and then slowly settle out with time and form mud or shales, mudstone shales, uh, within the system. And that's where you have the lake deposits. So that's where the deep water is sitting and sediment has time to, to settle down. And then they have around it, you can see there's lots of little mud cracks and there's these flatter laminations here. And so this is sort of the edge around the lake and there's mud cracks around it, lots of them, okay? And so then we go and look at these other rocks, which are mostly red, which I've shown you some pictures of. And you can see some of them you can't, there's not much in them, or else they have the big mud cracks. And here are these little funny little, these are the ripple cross lamination I have. OK, I'm going to show you. So the hint on what kind of lakes these are comes from around it. OK? So I'm going to show you these structures. and show you what they're telling me. So here's a close-up of that. So now you can see much better. Um, here's those mud cracks. And here's those ripple cross lamination symbols. And some of these mud, mud cracks are filled with sand. That's the little dot in there. Okay, That's where you can see them really well. And then you have these lakes here. And I, I have um, eight lakes. Some of them don't have the black shale. Some of them are just shallow lakes in here. OK, so let me show you what they look like. But the first impression here is that there's a lot of mud cracks. So this is really dry. So how can the dinosaurs even exist there? They're, they're as big as hippopotamuses, right? So they need water to live. And I'm not seeing a lot of indications that this water st sticks around, OK? So the first thing we look at is, oh, can't even see it. You see this band of white here? That's a sand sheet, OK? 
So they're not channels like they show in the picture. These are sand sheets. Those happen in very arid environments like deserts. It comes, the rain comes, you know, comes off of the side of the, of the valleys and then spreads out everywhere. And then it ends and it dries up and there's nothing left. So there's no, it's not a pleasant environment to say the least. So we can't even read that. Sheet flood, we call these sheet floods. And these sandstones have trough cross bedding in them. Yay, we know what that is, right? And so we know that the water really flew, uh, uh, flowed very, very quickly here, right? And the scale here is someone's ring. I didn't bring, think to bring anything here. And this one is not even going to show up, is it? Ugh. It's trough cross bedding, but has a lot of mud in it. A lot of mud movement in here that's sand size grains. So you got to see a lot of mixture of real quartz sand and mud sand, really. Okay? Can't see that. This one's better. Okay. So, guess what? I have graded bedding in these event deposits. So something from 10 to 20 centimeters thick, I have a gradation from sand up to these very fine, muddy, silty type particles. So this is graded bedding. This is two centimeters by two centimeters. And we always show which way is up, OK? And so this is a slab of rock from there. And this shows us that I have graded bedding in association with these sheet flood deposits. So that's telling me that these huge sheet floods then, of course, wound down and stuff started depositing, and then they ended. So the water didn't stay forever. It wound down, and I'll show you that some of these show mud cracks at the top. That means they dried out completely, okay? And I think they won't show because of the light. Nope, I can't see them. But there's mud cracks at the top of this one. <laughs> can't see it. Here's a better one. All right, so here is ripple cross lamination. And I cut this rock. I cut it with a, with a saw. <laughs> That's fun. And I did it at a wide angle so you could really see the crack. It's filled with sand, so it really stands out. And you can really see it, OK? So this is a filled mud crack. And this is mostly silt and mud here. Here's the scale for two centimeters and two centimeters. And this tells me that this was deposited quickly. Some of them graded. Some of them you have this bed load with ripple cross lamination. And then it ended, and then it dried out, and it cracked. And then the next bunch of sediment that came through filled the cracks. So this is again telling me that the environment is not very pleasant because it dries out. And these dinosaurs, I would think, need a lot of water. But this is not a good place for them. Oh, man, this is not turning out. You can vaguely see this one. This is a scale of 10 centimeters, 10 centimeters, 10 centimeters. And this is all mud. And it's mud cracks then in it. And they're filled with the same red mud. So you really can't see much, can you? Oh, there you go. OK, yes. OK. The exact, she wants to know how much, how age, what did they happen right afterward, are you saying, or is it happened 12 years later? The timing, not precisely, okay? We basically know that these mud cracks opened, they're at the surface, and whatever the next sedimentary event is, and it had to be the next one, that it was filled, and it was sand, and it filled it. Sometimes you find the sand above it which helps a lot. Sometimes it's not there anymore because it's eroded away. But we know that these are open at the surface. And you, if a lot of sediment's coming all the time, it should be within the next event, whatever that is. Okay? And this sediment is so nice, and it's not cracked very much, except in these areas. So I'd say pretty soon afterward, within the year or two, I don't know, five years at least. <laughs> all right? Yeah, we can't put dates on any of this, unfortunately. Any other questions? Good questions, really good questions. OK. So this is a little bit lighter. Here's this mud 
stone, or mud rock, we call it, and it has these mud cracks in it that are filled with the same red mudstone. And here I have a dinosaur footprint. Here, there's another kind of broken one here. Here's a little scale of little centimeters to give you an idea. And here's my foot, all right? So this is on a surface. You can start seeing what the surface looked like. The dinosaurs passed through, and it was kind of muddy, but then it dried out, and it filled in with so they might have passed through when it was a little bit wetter before it dried out, looking for fresh water, perhaps, OK? But once it dried out, we don't have much evidence that they, that they were there, but it's hard to tell because only you get the nice impressions when it's wet. But it's telling me that the dinosaurs like to pass through after an event, but I don't think they really like being there otherwise, right? And I have mud cracks in everything. And these are just very pretty because you have the red layer here of mud rock, and then you have these mud cracks filled with some quartz sand in there, so it looks pretty. And I have these ever They're everywhere, everywhere. Okay? You have evidence of water moving stuff, and then it dries out. It's a very constant theme here. Okay? And this is too, ah, doesn't show. There's big dinosaur footprint here. Maybe you see that. It's reversed here. I took the picture wrong. And the same sort of thing. It's everywhere. But those dinosaur footprints are everywhere, too. So they pass through. And this one's not going to show up either. It's too dark, huh? Yeah. Oh, well, there's a lot of mud cracks there, but we can't see them. So we look at the sediment. Oh, we can't even see this. And they're broken up. See, there's some of these white things. They're broken up pieces. So we can see different phases of breaking up of the sediment from the mud cracks, OK? So I can see a progression till it's a little bit cracked, and then it's a lot cracked, and then it, it's a mud, just a mess, a jumble, and then you don't see anything. It's just all homogeneously messy, OK? So we know that it was dry for certain different lengths of time, and the sediment broke up, and there was not a lot of water in between these events, right? Oh, then it turned out anyway. So you have these mud cracks in this sediment here, and it churns away because there's a lot of mud, and we start making soils. Okay, so we have special soils even being made. We can even identify them in here with time, especially when there's mud. It's easier to make soils quicker than than anything else. So we think that some of these soils can develop with less than a thousand years, depending on how much water brings how much sediment in, okay? But sorry you can't see that. These are really nice pictures. <laughs> this one is interesting. So I said there's soils. Well, when you have soils, you have to have plants, right? Botanists, there are no botanists really here. So <laughs> anyway, that's right. So you saw in the pictures that there were big trees that they had with the dinosaurs. Well, I don't see any roots that indicate trees anywhere, OK, in this particular formation. But I know it's too bad I can't see. There's little holes here, black things here, all across here. These, I think, are where roots used to be for little scrub brushes of some sort from the Jurassic, whatever they look like <laughs> in the past. And sometimes they're plugged with lime material, sometimes with sand. And so I think these soils had some sort of vegetation on it, but not these luxurious trees or anything like that. Sort of, you know, think of scrub brushy desert idea here, OK? This is, again, another example of the lake, deep lake sediment. How deep, I don't know. And here we have what we call, it's magnesite, magnesium carbonate. It's, we like to call this an evaporite. It's evaporate, evaporites because the water seems to have been saline in this really tough environment. Okay, so this lake isn't even nice to swim in, okay, or drink. We have indications that it was salty. Not like the ocean, but a different kind of salty, right? Different salts in it. <clears throat> Is this going to come out? So, and then mostly we have lots of clasts, pieces 
of sediment from outside the lake being dumped into the lake. And they're preserved, OK, from these sheet floods. And this is pretty common for these salty type lakes. Okay? This is not common for freshwater lakes. So I'm getting a, you were getting a really nice idea of how the system was put together. And of course, there's some places where it nicely settled out. And these are um, lime, calcium carbonate. And even these got broken up from things coming into the, into the lake. So we have, and these are the sediments that the fish are found in. So this might be one of the freshwater events, but it mostly seems to be salty lake. So this isn't even a nice place for dinosaurs to live in, all right? In some of these places we look, we try to find impressions of these salts. We don't know exactly what this is. I have no idea. We're guessing it's something called globarite. And there's a chemical equation for everybody, okay? Could be. And the only places that we find bones, it's not even in this deposit, somewhere else, in the basin, in this river valley from the past, from the Jurassic, and it's only casts of a little bit of bone from some dinosaur. So we, they don't even get preserved here, okay? It's not a good place to even preserve these things, let alone if they live there, you would hopefully find lots of little pieces of something. We don't even find that. So all this evidence is telling me that the dinosaurs did live there, okay? All these pictures of these things running around, they came through and got the fresh water when it was fresh, and then they left. They're done. <laughs> They're not going to stick around. So I'm not a good drawer or anything, but it gives you an idea. I didn't put all the little brushy things. I didn't know what they looked like. So we have all the sediment in sheets coming down into the valley toward the lake, and the lake is salty. So the dinosaurs would maybe come by when the water was fresher. That's why the footprints are there, but there's no other indication that they even lived there. Okay? And even the fish, some of the fish look like they didn't live there. They were brought in because you would expect to find a lot of poop from the fish, the coprolites, and there's not a lot of them in most of the rocks. So they didn't live there either. It wasn't a pleasant place to live at all. So basically, this is wrong. The animal may be correct, but they didn't ask a sedimentologist to tell them that that's not what it looked like in the past. All right? Paint a different picture for my East Berlin formation there, right? So the rocks can tell you a lot. They talk to me all the time, all right? So this is what I like to do for a living, is, is try to guess these things. But then, of course, there's always the problem of bringing the rocks home. And uh, what do you do with them? <laughs> I have like a ton and a half of rocks in my basement. My husband is not happy. <laughs> but this is what the life of a geologist is like. OK, any questions? I'm done. Yes, ma'am. You know, yeah, fossils, she wants to know how do you find fossils? Do you know exactly where to find them? <laughs> Go with Gar, that's right, Gar will know. Um, sometimes, it depends on the rocks. Uh, for my rocks, there's not much in them anyway, right? And around here, you know, we look at, we try to start with, with things that would preserve them better. Um, finer sediments to, uh, preserve fossils better, usually, but it all depends on how fast it's cemented and buried in the sediment. In Nelsonville, I would have to just look. <laughs> I would just look, but not in the big sandstones, maybe in the finer sediments, I would look there. But yeah, big, big trough, broad, trough cross bedded sandstones, you know, you might find burrows or something, but that's about it, you know, so it's more difficult. Yeah, there's not a good, lot of good fossils here. If you want good fossils, go to Western Ohio, Southwestern Ohio by Cincinnati, the most famous fossil locality there. They have billions, <laughs> I mean, it'd be Carl Sagan, billions of fossils there, very well preserved in limestone. They're beautiful. Very famous locality. People come from all over the world for that. Okay? They're much older. Any other questions? Yes.
Yes, they def uh, he wanted to know how do you see these footprints in the sediment. You know, do you see them right away or do you have to cut it open to see it or you don't know ahead of time that they're there. Sometimes you can tell by the depressions, uh, if it's on along a cliff, that there's something there. Um, but a lot of these, as you see, you want to see the bedding plane. You want to, you know, look down on the top of the surface of the sediment from the past. You could see them better. But you can also see them sideways in a lot of There's some examples around here, as a matter of fact, with reptile tracks found um, when you see a little bit of depressions and patterns, um, then you can, sometimes you can see it. What do you mean inside? Inside of a rock formation, they're in the... Yes, right. Oh, then you, yeah, well, I'm sure there's tons of those happening around. Yes. He wants to know that, that these things do, he wants to know how these things get preserved if you're stepping and then more sediment comes on top of it, is what he's saying, okay? I see. That's another issue. Yes. It all depends on the texture of the sediment when the dinosaur steps. And he deforms it. Then it dries out, and then it can get filled in, and then... Then it's protected enough that it can be preserved as other layers of sediment come on top of it. And then if it's cemented then afterward, then it can be preserved in the rock and you'd have to go digging into it to find it. How's that? Okay, I'd answered this question. Whew. You got a question over here? Oh, okay, you go first, you're the student. Yes. The, uh, she wants to know about the distribution of the footprints within the rock. And uh, some of them are random, but that Dinosaur State Park is a trackway. And they're like a herd going through. But it's not enough to know about migration, because it's a small area. But they're assuming that perhaps they're, they know they're going in one direction for whatever reason. So they're passing through of some sort. So they find a lot of them in that area that's famous for them. But the footprint I have, I found along the side of the road somewhere. So <laughs> I was just lucky. But I'm sure they're there all over. Jean. Oh, yes, that's right. Jean brought this fruit. I need some strong man here. Jean Andrews brought this. This is from Ohio or Western Pennsylvania. And so look how. Can you see the ferns that are preserved on that surface? See, even this gets preserved despite, despite the compaction and um, pressure, OK? Depending on what the circumstances are. So you can even get very fine fossils preserved. Thank you, Jean, um, on these. So this is a family heirloom from her family, um, and these are from um, either northern Ohio or western Pennsylvania, right? Yeah, and she got it from a garage sale somewhere in Cleveland. So that was a real deal, right? All right? So you can see that that compaction problem and that temperature problem is not so much to worry about in these things. We can preserve a lot of fauna, flora, and structures in the rocks to tell us the story of the past, right? I think that's it. Everyone happy? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>